We watch poo when we do our hair. Yo, what's up everybody? Uh, just another day here at the dojo. I've got some Q&A questions that I'm gonna uh, go through here for folks during today's episode, but uh, just to give you an update on the day, I uh, came in, my internet, of course, didn't work, so I had to sort that out, which made me extremely angry, which derailed all lots of cool shots that I wanted to make for the vlog. Uh, but then um, did some work, got a solid practice session in today, um, which I forgot to record, but that's okay, we're gonna get lots of juicy bagpipe stuff in this episode. So uh, without further ado, let's get into some of the questions that you guys have asked here for today's class. Did I just say today's class? You know what I meant, today's episode. All right, so I posted on Facebook here today and um, a, several folks wrote in with some good questions. Not a ton of folks, uh, but that's okay because if I answered 100 questions, this vlog would be like an hour. So we'll get to a couple of good ones here today. So um, I'm gonna work backwards here. So David asks, what are the main mistakes or skills that keep a grade four piper from moving up to grade three, from grade three to grade two, etc.? Okay, the answer to this question for me is very, very easy and simple. Okay, but people hear it and they're like, oh, well, um, okay, I'm great with those. So there must be something else. No, there's not. So look, when we play the bagpipes, okay, now this is my philosophy. When we play the bagpipes, there are a set of fundamental skills that we need to master in order to become master players, okay? On the two sides of the instrument, let's start with the first side, okay? Let's start with the finger work side of the instrument, all right? That means the way in which we wiggle our fingers. And right now, we're not talking about the sound of the bagpipes, that's the other side. But on this side, on the finger work side, there are approximately six fundamental skills we need to master. The first one I call scale navigation. Okay, that's our ability to move from note to note on the scale with no crossing noises. Okay, with no, with no unwanted sounds that get in the way of the melody that we're trying to make, okay? The next thing, okay, which is equally as important or equally as foundational as scale navigation is basic rhythm. We have to be able to play rhythms accurately, okay, and consistently, obviously, in order for our melodies to come out, right? Ba, ba, black sheep, have you any wool, right? There's melody there, and then there's rhythm. And, and the rhythms aren't difficult in that particular example, but there is a rhythm there, and we need to have control. So very, 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 very few, like maybe one in 25 grade four pipers have inherently great scale navigation and basic rhythm. But like that's two. Now the next one is grace note quality. So obviously pipers use grace notes to articulate notes. There's a very specific way to play a grace note properly and you have to play grace notes properly every single time. Okay, very few people in grade four have a great control over grace notes yet. Okay, then after grace notes, there's embellishment quality. And then there's um, sort of two different types of expression uh, items that are co core fundamentals. We go into those in do at the dojo all the time. But where I'm going with this is, okay, on the finger work side, you have to show really solid aptitude in all of these fundamentals. And as you start to do so, you're going to just inherently be ready for the next level. People that make it to grade three are people that have good scale navigation, good rhythm, good grace notes. Maybe not perfect yet, but they're good. There's an understanding there. On the instrument side, okay, we need tonal quality, and then we need quality of tuning. So we need the instrument to sound great, and there's a set of skills that we use to hone our instrument and to make it sound better. Obviously, steady blowing is one of those skills. Good maintenance skills, making steady blowing possible, that's one of those skills. Um, but as your bagpipe starts to sound better and better, um, that will also be, these will be the ingredients that get you to the next grade level, right? So the moral of this particular question is, master the fundamentals um, and you're gonna start to ascend the grade levels. Um, there's a lot of mystery out there, right? You'll see stuff on your score sheet, like you need more light and shade. 
or your tempos are too low, or this, that, or the other thing, right? These are, uh, these are things that can sometimes lead you down a path that doesn't directly pertain to your fundamentals. Get organized with the fundamentals, work on them uh, a little bit every day, right? Hard work, developing fundamentals every day, and then you'll start to see the next grade level happen for you. So it's probably about, it is about almost 11 a.m. And what I'm doing is recording today's daily dose. Um, and what a daily dose is, is like, um, it's, it's like a daily workout kind of, but it's very small. It's, it's meant for each of our members on our site to spend five or so minutes doing. And so it's like a little exercise that we put on. Um, and then the Dojo U member uh, actually records that lesson, posts it to a secret Facebook group that we have for members. And then uh, we give them feedback in Facebook form. And it's just a great way for people to work at their craft a little bit every day. So what I'm going to do, just to be goofy, is I'm going to record myself recording a daily dose. Let's try it. Okay. Hopefully you can see the screen. And then uh, the other people are going to see you here. So uh, let's get going. So here's my little recording monitor here. And this is where I'm going to be talking. Hey guys, welcome. I'm sure you think this is kind of strange. I'm actually recording myself, recording a daily dose uh, for one of my vlog episodes. Today in the daily dose, I want to focus on physical blowing mechanics. And we're just going to do the most basic physical blowing exercise today, which is just to blow a single note, okay? And to try to work on uh, blowing, okay? Blowing in the instrument, transitioning into the squeeze, squeezing and then transitioning back. And that's our blowing cycle. And we're trying to get that nice and steady at the sweet spot. So um, it's a little bit different today. I'm gonna play, um, I'm gonna review the concept of physical steady blowing with you, okay? And then I'm going to append a lesson that I've done in the past about you know how to, how to physically blow well at the sweet spot. I'm gonna put that at the end of this video and that's going to conclude the daily dose. So your job is to try to get a video recording of you blowing steadily at the sweet spot. Okay, see if we can see the water moving around. Hopefully we can also see your mechanics at least a little bit so that we can give you the best feedback possible on Facebook. So that is your challenge today. I hope you accept it so we can drill down into making your bagpipe sound uh, better and better. Okay, that's my little uh, mini episode. Usually obviously I talk longer. This is sort of a strange episode. I'm gonna do a little bit of editing. Uh, make sure this guy fits my screen well. Um, and I'll be able to save that and mix that down later to a file. So that's, uh, that's me making a daily dose. Next question, how much of a tonal difference does a high bag have over a hybrid synthetic bag? Um, the answer is a huge difference, okay? There's a huge tonal difference there. Uh, but for beginners and intermediates, right, that difference is less important than it might be for an advanced player. So I don't want you to overthink the difference between hide and synthetic bags too much, okay? You should play whatever makes the most sense for you. With that said, at the dojo, when I start a beginning player, I always start them on a hide pipe bag, okay? Hide pipe bags do indeed sound the best. Um, they're also uh, the easiest to control. They have a nice uh, feel to them and it's easier to get starts and stops and to learn those fundamentals. It's also uh, much better for learning the, uh, the basics of bagpipe moisture control and bagpipe maintenance and a whole bunch of things. So I'm not going to go too long into that response, but uh, I'm a big, big fan of hide bags. Okay, Don't buy into the myth that hide bags take a lot more maintenance than synthetic bags. They don't. They take maybe a little bit more, uh, but it's only a little bit. Uh, if, for example, seasoning your bag, right? You'll do it a couple times when the bag is brand new, but after that, you'll really only need to season your bag eh, maybe once every two months or so if you're playing regularly. And I don't think that's too much to ask in exchange for uh, learning some of these key fundamentals like starts and stops and moisture control and maintenance and actually learning those properly. So don't overthink the difference, but I highly recommend a high bag. Off to the gym and then I'll be back here to do some more work this afternoon. Next question. 
What is the best, easiest way to move up a chanter reed strength and reduce the amount of frustration of keeping the reed playing? I play an easy reed and I have strike in issues because of that. When I move up a strength, I really struggle to keep the reed playing. Do I need to try a variety of reeds to find the next step up? Don't rush the next step up, okay? Uh, learn how to do a strike in with a slightly easier reed, okay? And then gradually increase the strength that you play. Um, don't try to jump a level up and don't overthink it. So um, one of the things that I would recommend is having two bagpipe chanters. One, so you know, that might take a little investment on your part, right? Uh, but, but buy a backup McCallum, I love the McCallum Polypenko Chanter as a great backup. It's very affordable too, um, but that, that's a good example. I have, um, I have a couple of different backup chanters, but one chanter should be your prime time chanter. That's the one you perform on. That's the one where the read's gonna be a little bit easier. And yes, you do have to get the strike ins to sound good even with an easier read because you're just not at the level yet where you're ready to push yourself to the limit with the strength. And then you have another training read. Okay, this would be like running, running a, you know, three miles with a weighted vest or something like that. But then you have your training read, okay? And someday that training read might become your performance read as you build strength. But the number one thing I would advise you is never, ever, 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 ever try to perform with a read that's too hard for you. Okay, and don't do practice Right? Don't practice your technique or your starts or your stops on your training read. That should be done on your comfortable read that you're comfortable with. Okay? And then you train yourself gradually into the higher strength. And once, you're, once that higher strength becomes your performance strength, then you get a new training read that's much harder. If I'm being honest, I uh, solve this problem ev almost every day uh, because my band read is quite hard to play. Okay? And then my solo read is much easier and that's my sort of, that's my core performance read. But by practicing my band pipes a little bit every day, I build up that strength that I need. And then, you know, uh, come the peak season with the band, I'll get yet another band read um, that's probably right in the pocket exactly where I want to perform with it. Okay. Just crushed it. Now home to eat some decent food. At least that's the game plan. Mark says, any tricks other than wiping your face with your pinky to keep the burl finger going. And he's like, I've seen Stuart Little stick his hand in his pocket. So there's two main tricks I know that some people use with the burl. The first trick is you take your burl finger and you start, sort of wipe it on your eye because your eye is always kind of greasy, especially after you've been playing pipes for a few minutes. And that can help your pinky slide over the hole and to not get stuck, which is kind of an interesting trick. I, and I definitely use it sometimes. Some people, now I can't speak for Stuart Little, I don't know if he uses this trick, but some people actually have some talcum powder, which is the same sort of thing. It, it, it decreases the friction of your pinky on the chanter. Um, some people keep talcum powder maybe in a pocket or in a sporin that they use as well. So, you know, food for thought there. Um, you can definitely um, try those tricks. At the end of the day though, probably best to just be able to get a burl without needing those things. Uh, but those are the two tricks that I know of. Check it out. The uh, drawbridge here is up, which it's kind of a drag because it's going to make me later than I already am, but pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, it's really only cool the first time, I guess, right? <laughs> Especially if you live around here, you're like, oh my God. Okay, Rob is uh, on with a bit of an interesting question here. He wants to hit the solo circuit wearing trousers or trues instead of a kilt. What's my take on that? Uh, I can't pull off trues, so I'm kilt man all the way. Um, and, but however, uh, people like Glenn Brown and Chris Armstrong, I've seen them pull that off before and it looks really sharp. Uh, so it's definitely different. It's all up to you. I would do a little bit of I would do a little bit of, uh, I would sleep on that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Private lessons that concentrate on solo work only, what approaches would be best? Treat it as a competition and only get one shot at the piece and then have the instructor smack the hammer down or traditional learning with note by note instruction, etc. The answer is it all depends on the learner. Uh, I'm not a strong advocate of solo lessons. 
I do have a few students that I teach solo lessons, but frankly, they do a poor job uh, with that platform. The problem with solo lessons is people just show up and want to learn stuff, right? But what needs to happen is you have to have something specifically prepared for your lesson. You have to prepare that thing, and then the lesson can be spent honing in that thing and developing it. Uh, what I would recommend, what I do for my lessons, is I make a recording of myself. And I do what you're talking about here. I get one take, I do my best job, and whatever comes out, that's what I show to my instructor. Um, and then uh, my instructor and I will spend the time during the lesson deconstructing that and working on the key things that need to be worked on. Uh, but yeah, use the lesson, right? Prepare something for the lesson and get feedback. And then your particular instructor is going to uh, structure that les lesson into what they think is the best format for you, okay? So, uh, but the key thing with private lessons as a platform for learning is you must prepare and then present what you've prepared to the instructor during that session. Don't just plop your butt down there with no plan, having done no real practice, um, and expect to get much out of it. Um, and by the way, it's a great way to tick off your instructor too. Um, good, so that's the end of today's questions. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll do some more of these episodes of the vlog as time goes by. But hopefully you found that really helpful. Just reflecting a little bit on the answer to that first question today. I think that basically kind of sums up the Piper's Dojo method, uh, you know, pretty well, which is, I think, so many people assume bagpiping is this mystical thing for which the answers can only be found like uh, in remote corners of the globe and only a few people quote have what it takes and all this stuff and um, I don't like that idea at all I never really have and as much as maybe I kind of had that secret talent that pipers are supposed to have you know, and I really came up fast as a youth, so I've kind of experienced that side of things, but at the end of the day, just like any other artistic or competitive pursuit, right, and bagpiping is a little bit of both, you know, at least to the community I hang out at in most often, right, there is a set of fundamental skills, right, that set of skills can be clearly defined and our time should be spent working to master those fundamental skills first and foremost, right? And then once we become masters of those fundamental skills, um, then we can play with the rules of the fundamentals in order to achieve, you know, greater and greater music and more artistic merit as we go, right? That's basically it. That's the method in a nutshell.